Welcome to this conversation with Teela Watson as part of the Wheeler Center's 2021 Die Gribble Argument event series, which honors the late Die Gribble, a true force in cultural and intellectual life of so-called Australia. This year, the 2021 Die Gribble Argument responds to the issue of climate change. Writers Teela Watson, who we're about to hear from now, Victor Stevenson, and Bruce Pascoe have written essays that discuss and reflect on issues of climate change, environment, and connection to country. You can read these essays in full at thewillacenter.com. However, before we do move further in with this chat, firstly, I would like to say Nanganamulana Yenbana, Yotiota Waka, Gatanio Yotioti Yir. I pay respect to this land that I am on which is land of my people, the Yori Yora. I honor my ancestors that have paved the way for me and are continuing to be present, are continuing to guide all people on my people's country. And I also acknowledge all other countries where people are watching from today to listen to this chat and acknowledge all the ancestors in those lands, the elders in those lands, past, present, and future as well, where sovereignty has not been seated on any of those lands. So the conversation here today, it is with myself and the incredible Teela Watson, and we will be discussing her piece, Intrinsic Connections Between Ecocide and Genocide. And it's a pleasure to have this chat today, uh, albeit not the original arrangement, which was to be in person at the Wheeler Centre in so-called Melbourne but it's still a pleasure to have this yarn today. Uh, welcome, Sis Teela. Uh, such a pleasure to have this chat, and I invite you to introduce yourself to all of listening here today. Thank you. Um, as you said, my name's Teela Watson. I'm Biri Gabori in Kangaloo. I'm a Murray, um, and I perform under the name Ancestress as well and do poetry, music, stuff like that. Um, I want to also acknowledge the country that I'm on, the sovereignty that continues of the people, of the law, of the country, and also your country too, and everyone, all the countries where people might be watching from as well. Thank you for that introduction. It's a, it's a special privilege to have been able to engage with this very powerful piece of work that you've written as a part of this series and certainly a cornerstone to to all of those uh, pieces and responses of work that that were delivered and to engage with it and to understand at least in as much as i could from reading it was a privilege so i want to honor firstly what it took for you to write this piece and everything that it meant to you to write this piece which was obviously incredibly personal for you to speak on the things that you did within this piece of writing. And it was clearly linked to a lot of work that you've been doing ongoing. This work isn't brand new for you to engage into this subject matter whatsoever. And it also has strike, uh, quite powerful personal links for you as well in terms of your own connection to country and also um, some of the negative impacts as well, which we have to be very real that negative impacts are happening every day to country across this whole landmass of so-called Australia, which is really Indigenous land. And in saying that you are a, a Birigaba and Gangaloo woman, and very sad to say, as it's sad to say for so mob, so many mob across country, there have been impacts on your mob's country from mining uh, particularly, is there a bit you would like to talk about in terms of when you first heard about this mining occurring on your country and how that has, I guess, impacted your, I guess, you know, it's not so much your work, but your your personhood as, as a First Nations uh, woman in this country that's uh, doing everything that they can to uphold uh, your rightful position in so-called contemporary society? Yeah, I think 
Well, really, I, I grew up knowing there was mines on my country. I think for a little while, um, Maura, which is my middle name, was actually the mining capital. Um, it might still be depending on how things are, but it's hard to keep a track, to be honest, of all of the mining and the destruction that is happening. Um, I think for me, <clears throat> it's been part of the, I guess, part of the parcel of, you know, growing up and learning about your identity and learning about the world, you know, you born into a world and you look around and start finding out things about it, you know. Um, so I think I've been lucky in the sense though, because my family have always been very um, active in the land rights movement and stuff like that. So I think I was able to have a strong sense of identity um, despite knowing about, you know, not just the mining, but the things that have happened to our people throughout the colonial process. So I think it's been, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, like everything, I guess, that connects and affects people, um, you know, it's helped to, I guess, form my uh, perspectives on things. It's helped for me, you know, to, to learn about myself. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very hard thing, I think, to come up against and to think about trying to put an end to. And there's been often times when I want to move home back to my country and knowing that it's such a mining town, um, but also knowing that, you know, the culture up there in terms of mainstream kind of culture is very much pastoralist. It's very much mining. It's very much, you know, um, destruction of country. And, and it's also really racist, you know, being central Queensland, um, uh, you know, I've had experiences when I go up just to visit and it's like, wow, okay. Um, you know, not to, not to talk badly about anyone in those towns, um, but it is a different feeling than being in the city. Um, and that also is not to afford any, um, any good things to the mob, in, to whitefellas in the city, you know, or the, the mainstream kind of um population in the cities but yeah it is a very different the way that um things work is different up there and i think it's really hard to um it's really hard for i think for mob to try and encourage people to relate to country differently when they've generationally been um, invested in mining and invested in, uh, you know, spraying poisons onto their crops, which then go into the river. Um, I think it's hard for people to adjust when they've been, um, you know, generationally blind to the impacts of their own uh, practices and they've, all, all they've do, done is profit off yeah yeah there's um there's something you really spoke to there which made me reflect upon the fact that so many mob we we grow up and for a certain period of our upbringing it may not be acutely uh something that that we're conscious of uh in terms of things that that we can even impact on in any way uh, certainly as as you know young children from a very young age there's there's obviously so many things we can can impact on but at the same time there are things going on all around us that are forming and influencing our identity and how that forms in the world and one of the things you really had me thinking about there was how as indigenous people in uh, a colonially uh, upheaval society construct that that we've been forced to be uh, developed within, we have these impacts on pretty much every mob's country 
across the whole landmass of so-called Australia, which actually means that our identity is forming in some sort of sense of an adjusted version of, of an identity to be able to engage uh, in whatever ways that, that we can engage with uh, these these devastating impacts, which we we have to in some way engage with in terms of carrying out our custodial responsibility, uh, whether or not we're enabled to do so. And for yourself, a way that you've you've certainly done that it is through your art in a very powerful way. And um, again, it, it could be a conscious thing for, for mob as artists, but in other ways, it could be a very natural thing. Would you like to speak a little bit to how I guess you've used your art to respond to that position in being a, a First Nations woman in a, a colonial uh, upheaval society through through your art and just more broadly as well. Yeah. Well, I think that I think that growing up in a in a family that has been um, active and I guess ha has had insight into what is happening and what's been happening politically here. It means that I got to grow up with a knowledge of the fact that we are in a war, um, in a sense. I wasn't told from my old people, like, we're in a war, but um, <clears throat> the knowledge of, of what's happened and the way that um, I was able to learn about it certainly gave me that impression. Um, and so knowing that, you know, we are still fighting for our country back, um, knowing that, you know, we've inherited a legacy of, um, you know, not just sovereignty, but the cultural knowledges that we have, the sophistication that our people have had for thousands of years, uh, the connections that we have, the connections that we can make, um, and, and the things that we are a part of, as well as the fact that, you know, we do have this colonial state that is trying to diminish that and that continues to take away whatever it can from us. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think for me, art has always been a way that I can have self-determination. And so in storytelling, in songwriting, in poetry, it's a way for me to be able to practice being self-determining. Um, in saying that as well, I was always like um, very, very artistic. My auntie, who was um, a very well-known storyteller who's now passed away, her name was Maureen Watson. She was really inspiring to me as a child. She was involved with the beginnings of black theater. Um, she was involved with, you know, the, um, obviously the tent embassies, like a lot of different movements, but she also traveled the world as a storyteller. Um, she was an educator, a playwright, you know, um, all of these amazing things. And she would sit us down and tell us riddles and, you know, um, get us thinking and get us using our brains and get us, you know, challenging ourselves to be smarter and to be cluey. And so it was always, there was always a very intellectual side to the creative energy that was happening. Um, so I think that was really important as well. And also knowing like, you know, um, even my father used to, he used to tell us like he used to tell me stories about Murray locks instead of Goldilocks. Um, and so um, the Murray locks stories were stories about, you know, this little girl and um, she would go along with her brother and sister and they would get up to different things, but it was always about her learning a lesson. Um, and, and they would always be, you know, it would be a simple lesson in the story. But then when you look at it, um, you know, now as an adult, I look back and I think, wow, okay that was a life lesson. Like, you know, there's so many layers. Um, and that's, and that's Murray storytelling too, you know, um, that's, that's the kind of power in the way that 
mob tell stories. It's it can the the metaphorical aspect um, always transcends. Um, so the story can be as simple as anything, but it can be one of the most profound, you know, meaning of life kind of um, meanings that come through. So, yeah, but I think, you know, having that kind of inspiration and that kind of experience as a child and having storytelling being such a big part of my life and upbringing, I think that really helped me to um, to take naturally to that process of of storytelling and um, music and poetry, but I also just really always wanted to sing when I was little. Like I, I remember um, it was funny actually. Like I remember being like four and five and being at a family gathering, and I'd like stand on the table and be like, "Can I have your attention, everyone?" And then I'd like sing songs about why we shouldn't cut down trees because we need the air to breathe. Um, <laughs> It's really like, you know, I, I'm a bit embarrassed by it now because I would not do that, obviously, now. <laughs> um, but I've come back to, you know, throughout the years I, I, you know, grew up and was a teenager and I wanted to be cool. So I certainly wasn't singing about trees then um, or not in the same ways. Um, but, you know, now I've come back to that same idea of, you know, I'm singing about why we shouldn't be cutting the trees down. You know, I'm singing about natural resources. Um, and so I find that really interesting um, as well because it's it's similar to, you know, I guess that metaphor transcending and those lessons come in full circle. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think it's always been a self-determining thing for me, you know, especially like because I started performing and writing when I was really young. Um, like, as I said, like I was four and five making songs up, but, you know, I started performing more professionally around the age of like 12, 13, 14, started going to youth workshops and creating material that way. And I'd perform around, um, Brisbane city and, you know, we'd go other places as well. And I had a few songs and stuff like that with other people. And, you know, I think it's always been a process of, being able to be self-determining and being able to, um, I guess, make decisions because, you know, when you're a young person, um, you know, you just can't wait to grow up, you know, you can't wait to grow up and be able to, you know, live some life that you imagine with no bills <laughs> and, um, you know, no responsibilities, um, so I think for me, it was always a way for me to practice being self-determining and practice, um, you know, saying what I wanted to say about the situation and the world, I guess, that I was um, born into. Yeah, that's so powerful. And a couple of things you touched on there that really resonated well, all of it resonated, but um, a couple of things you really spoke to there, certainly self-determination, that really gets me to thinking about, I guess, the the um, the responsibility and obligations for First Nations people to, to take a certain position within the lands that our people cared for for thousands of years. But, but even if we're living off country, it doesn't mean that we don't still have that a responsibility that's so deeply intrinsically built within our being and our and our spiritual essence as well. And then another thing that you really spoke about there was some of your relationships, which is a really beautiful thing to to hear more about that on, on a personal level, because it is also something that you spoke to quite a bit within the piece that you wrote as well and spoke about it in such a, a beautiful way. And you spoke about relationality through your piece. And the following paragraph speaks about how relationships to land is where all meaning is derived from, which I absolutely could not love this more. And the paragraph goes, the two most important kinds of relationship in life are firstly those between land and people. And secondly, those amongst people themselves, the second being always contingent upon the first. The land and how we treat it is what determines our humanness because land is sacred and must be looked after. 
the relation between land and people becomes a template for society and social relations. Therefore, all meaning comes from the land. All meaning comes from the land. I love that infinitely. And it's such a poignant point. And it really, it, it came through a lot in what you're talking about in terms of relationships. Would you like to speak a bit more about this, um, this, for lack of a better word, construct of all meaning coming from the land? Well, that, that quote comes from Annie Mary or Dr. Dr. Mary Graham. Um, I remember when I was first introduced to that quote, it was by my father. And I felt as though he, when he introduced me to that quote and he, he kind of broke it down for me so that I could really, you know, um, understand it. And I remember I'd ask questions all of the time, like, um, you know, and, and it would just further kind of, I guess, like teach me, you know, about that quote and like, you know, what I was learning about. But I think for me, that quote gave me a kind of template. Um, it gave me a template through which to look at and uh, examine different things and different ideas and different questions that I had. Um, so it was really, it was really empowering for me learning that quote, but also um, to realize that, you know, Annie Mary, because Annie Mary was, is really close friends still with my Annie Lilla. And so, and, you know, the rest of my family as well. So I grew up seeing Annie Mary around all the time, you know, and Annie Lilla and like, you know, that's, Annie Lilla's my family. Annie Mary is Annie through, you know, through her close relationship to family, but you kind of grow up and then you, you know, you see a quote like that and you go, oh my God, this whole time, Annie Mary is like a genius. <laughs> and then, you know, I've just been a kid running around and getting her cuppers and, you know, so you kind of just go, oh, what? Like, it was a little bit mind blowing because I was just like, um, this is probably the best piece of information. You know, it just really, it really unlocked a lot for me, I think. And it gave me a way to understand the world on a very deep, like much deeper level and a way to decipher what, you know, it, it gave me a way to understand my own perspective as a Murray woman, but also a way to make decisions about what I agreed with or didn't agree with as a Maori woman um, and what I saw sense in or didn't see sense in as a Maori woman. So I think, yeah, it was really, it, it was massive for me. It was massive for me. And it still obviously influ influences my learning as well and my craft. Um, but, you know, I remember there was a lot of questions that I would run through that template and push myself and challenge myself to understand more. Questions like, why didn't our people have written language? you know, um, and I would, I would ask that question and then I would look at that quote. I'm like, okay. And so, you know, not just that quote, but other, other kind of things that I've been learning about as well. And it, you start to find different answers to these types of questions and it's materials like that. It's, 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 uh, it's an understanding of that quote, but it's so much more than a quote. Um, it's it, like it, it is kind of a construct, but it's, it's it's like a framework, you know. It's like a framework, I think, for me. So yeah, I, I love that quote, um, and I encourage everyone to just think on it as well, um, because it is something that really uh, has the potential to unlock a great understanding of life. I think. Yes, it's um, it's so affirmative that. That statement for me, it's um, it is like a portal to to the beginning of, of learning for so many of us, and certainly that was the feeling I had when I first looked at those words. It was just yes, um, I don't know what more a book can tell me other than just staring down the 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 face of of everything the country is, which, as you speak to, there's so many ways that. That you cannot quantify that and 
this is one of the great beautiful things of our indigenous cultures is that there are elements of of requiring experience and requiring openness uh, which is in contrast to colonial practices which obviously have been in so many ways about shutting doors on certain avenues of understanding and approaching things in in a manner which you've described it particularly in your article in terms of as an apparatus which is something that com completely conjures images that, that are in opposite contrast to this beautiful message and you go deeper in your piece then furthermore about that in terms of how do we get away from colonial processes and what is it actually going to take and you speak about the i guess the dehumanized state that the colonial construct and those that are working in alignment have come to and here's a section from your piece i'm going to read through in regards to that in order to dehumanize another, one must also dehumanize themselves first. Since dehumanization requires depleting one's capacity to witness the humanness of others. In the same way, the colonial gaze sees an absence of life in country. And this view allows people to justify the willful destruction of life in country. Through teachings that have been handed down from various elders, it is my understanding that the meaning of humanness also includes personal sovereignty, autonomy, and obligation. You speak about how personal sovereignty holds responsibility, which holds us to a deeper sense of humanness. This, to me, is such a, a powerful point in terms of how, I guess, in a lot of instances, there's a lot of misunderstanding around what Indigenous sovereignty can mean and what it can actually mean in a way that strikes fear into people. And so I really love how what you're actually speaking to is, is the, the rich, uh, the beauty, uh, the nourishing elements that sovereignty provides as well, that uh, Blackfellas have been living in accordance with pre-colonisation uh, beginning and, and still continuing to do so. Um, in many ways, articulated in others, um, less articulated. Would you like to speak a bit in regards to this particular aspect of your piece? Yeah, I think a lot of people misunderstand, <clears throat> or a lot of people, not just people, I think the, the mainstream kind of philosophy and logic leads people to think in a very confined and limited way about the idea of sovereignty about the idea of life really which is also what the piece is about um you know western colonial logic and philosophy kind of makes us put things in boxes and um when we put something in a box you know it limits us and it stops it stops us from making connections and, and I think that's one of the biggest issues with the, the, that way of thinking. Um, <clears throat> sovereignty is, you know, I, th I think the thing, the thing also that uh, pe people like, people don't understand about words is like words hold meaning. Words don't really mean things. They indicate meaning to me, I think, because there's words like sovereignty, there's words like love, you know, and we can use those words in a thousand different ways and they can mean a thousand different things. And I think that's also part of the love-hate relationship I have with words as an artist. Um, but really, I think um, it's not that there is one true meaning, but it is that there are millions of meanings. And I think people like to think of of indigenous sovereignty in um, you know this kind of idea that the Uluru statement has put out there, which I completely don't agree with for the record. 
um, that sovereignty is a spiritual notion. Um, and I don't completely not agree with that idea, but I completely don't agree with the idea of stating that sovereignty is a spiritual notion without actually stating that it's also a very real and very uh, true, proper legal notion um, that we do rightfully, lawfully own this country. And I mean L-A-W because I don't believe our mob had uh, fairy tale laws. I believe our laws were very serious with very serious legal ramifications um, within our own legal systems. But I think that a lot of people like to use the word sovereignty to describe a lot of different things, whereas the meaning of sovereignty, um, from my perspective as an Indigenous woman, while it does have many meanings, while it does have very many layers, I think in essence, the meaning is something that um, is, it's about connection and it's about creating, uh, it's, it's about a foundational connection to country that creates within us a job and a set of obligations, a set of, you know, relationality um, and, and connections but it is definitely tied into humanness. And so I think that one other thing, and I, I'm sorry, my thoughts are a little bit scattered. Um, but one of the other things that I wanted to mention was um, a lot of the things that my Aunty Lil has been teaching me about child rearing practices, um, cause she's just so knowledgeable about it. And, you know, obviously I have kids, so I'm trying to be a good mum. Um, but a lot of the things that she's been teaching me have really led me to understand that we are, the way that we raise our babies is to teach them from as early as they are born to be self-governing, not in the way that we will leave them to their own devices or uh, abandon them, not at all, but in the sense that we are giving them the tools to be able to be self-governing. And this means to be um, autonomous, um, to be able to make autonomous decisions, to be able to have an, uh, the ability to be independent, independent thinkers, um, and to be able to also know how to connect and be congenial while remaining in their own sovereignty and personhood. Um, because sovereignty operates on many levels. And I think a lot of people do see it as, you know, Aboriginal sovereignty versus the crown, um, which it is, but it's also about how we physically embody our own sovereignty as human beings. And this is something that I think a lot of other people who aren't Indigenous people think they might struggle with. And I don't, I think some people don't realize that they're entitled to it. Um, and even, uh, you know, even, even though we're black fellas, even if I was in my country, you know, my personal sovereignty, it doesn't go unchecked and it doesn't go without uh, things that govern it, you know, um, for us to be full sovereign, autonomous beings, uh, we must be governed by something, you know, otherwise it could lead to, you know, who knows, but it must be governed. And so the governing, the governing comes from not only law, uh, being natural law, but it also come, um, the qualities and the characteristics that have been grown in us. Um, like our sovereignty is grown in us, like our autonomy is grown in us um, by culture. But there are other things that are grown in us that help to govern the, the parts of our personhood that are autonomous and, and lead in that sovereignty. So things like sharing food, and my dad used to talk about this a lot as well, and my auntie still talks about it. Um, <clears throat> so when we share food with our babies, 
um, like when, as soon as the baby is born, um, even if the baby, like if the baby starts drinking water, um, you know, anything other than like breast milk, then you will give the baby the water bottle and let the baby have some. And then you go, oh, mm, I have some too. Oh, thank you for sharing, you know. And so it's the same thing when they start eating and we give food and then we say, oh, mm, thank you for sharing. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, thank you, you know. Um, but what we're doing when we teach our babies to share is we're introducing the reflective motive uh, because babies are naturally born with the possessive motive because it tells them when they're hungry, it tells them when they're uncomfortable, it tells them when they need something, you know. Um, and so once they have been introduced to that reflective motive, it means that they are capable of reflecting not just reflection of self, but reflection of others. So they start to think. And when you want to share with a baby and you go and say, oh, can I have some? Uh, that baby will look at you hard because it's trying to figure out, like, do I want to share with this one? You know, do, do I want to share with this fella? Uh, what what was last time? What's my last experience with this fella? Was that, did that fella share with me when I wanted that fella, you know? Um, so that baby starts thinking about what, relationality is ex they're experiencing but they also start thinking about um you know the past experiences but what it's really teaching them is to think about someone other than themselves someone that wants what they want which is food um just as much as them and someone that whose face lights up when you give it to them and so there's all of these social things that happen when we do that um and it, it triggers empathy um, there was a study uh, that said that um, I think 40% of Americans had lost empathy. Um, so it was through these studies that they started actually uh, really, really working on the idea of empathy training. Really it has come up recently because the Prime Minister is in us. Um, but so this idea of like empathy training um, we really never needed that because without the child rearing practices that we have, people are leaving their babies at the, to the chance because in that study, they found that um, if empathy isn't triggered at an early age, it can lie dormant in the brain. And so that means that there are people who never grow past the possessive motive um, and they never grow past um, or, or, or they never end up being able to quite um, to really grow that empathy, uh, you know, that the idea of it laying dormant in the brain. Um, so the way that we had measures in place that were, um, you know, to, to make sure that our baby's empathy was triggered, um, it is a cultural practice that is handed down. And any Murray family now, you go and you see the mothers just naturally, they teaching them babies to share that food. And a lot of mob, you know, we don't, always think about why we do things or, you know, what it means. But when you really think about it, such a simple thing that is, that is so natural for black fellas to do, it's actually really important because it's teaching our babies, it's triggering that empathy, but it's also teaching our babies that they are autonomous. It's teaching them that they are sovereign. It's teaching them that they are a part of a community and that they make a difference in the world. And so there are so many things that just that one simple practice of sharing food, um, it is teaching that baby to become self-governing. And so because that baby gets to make a decision about whether or not to share that food, because the other thing is if the baby says, no, I'm not going to share with you, that's okay. It doesn't have to share. The, it, it's the idea that they are being presented with the opportunity um, it's the idea that they're being presented with the, the autonomy to say no or yes, you know, and then the most important part is that you do respect what they say and you do listen. If they say no, then it's like, okay, then I'm sad, whatever, you know? Um, but the important part is that they get to make a decision because a lot of the time in other cultures, well, in the mainstream dominant culture, a lot of children are not able to make decisions and they're told that um you know that if they want to make their own decisions then they have to wait until they're an adult and you know 
then we have adults that are all of a sudden adults that have to make all these decisions and they've never actually gotten to make a decision before. Um, so I think it's really, you know, there's a lot of really powerful information in our child rearing practices. And I can't remember why we started talking about this. Sorry. I love that you were talking about all of that. And, and it's really, we started off a conversation around, around sovereignty and the relationships that, that our sovereignty is also based into. It's the beginning of it because we can't expect our babies to grow up and be sovereign beings if we never allow them the chance to explore that or experience that. Um, and it is through our families and through our communities that we learn what it is to be self-governing and to be sovereign. And so, you know, again, that empathy that is triggered, that is one of the things that help to uh, govern our sovereignty um, and our autonomy because if we have sovereignty and autonomy without empathy and without congeniality, um, that that's very dangerous, you know? Um, yeah. I just love that we got to that beautiful, beautiful place and talking about, you know, bringing it all the way back to, to babies and how crucial they are in our communities and that ultimately, they will inherit what is left over once, once we are gone. And, and so it, it would be remiss. We need to talk about what is being left for children and what they're being taught and how are they being grown from, from that young age that, that a baby also has a learning around sovereignty to be immersed into. Definitely. Because we can't expect anyone to become sovereign when they hit an, an age, you know. Um, and it's it's really interesting too. There was there was something in the media a while ago that blew up around consent, and I found that really interesting. Um, and it was a few years ago, I think, or maybe a year or two. But a lady wrote a tweet or something, and it was saying that um, it was it was in order to teach consent and she was saying you should ask your baby's consent before you change their nappy and I think it went on like one of them trashy daytime tv or like morning shows or something um, and they kind of like blasted it and was like oh blah, blah. but actually when I saw it I was like that is so true you know um, we can't teach our babies about something we don't give them an entitlement to you know, if you want to teach kids about consent, you got to give them a right to it. You know, um, if you want to teach kids about sovereignty, you got to give them a right to it. You know, if you want your kids to make good decisions, you got to let them practice. You know, you got to let them have decisions and make decisions. Um, my my kids, like my son, um, when he started preschool um, or like kindy, he. <laughs> He, like the third day in, he grabbed me by the hand when I was dropping him off and he took me down to this place where the, the teacher was and the teacher was a man. Um, and he said, sit down here, mum. And I was like, all right, so I'm sitting there. And he went up to that fella. He was like a meter or two away from me. And he goes, oi. And this is like my tiny little son looking up at this big man. And that fella looked down and he goes, I'm mine, boss. And he like hit his chest and all. He's like, I'm my own boss. I'm bossing myself. And I was like, oh, okay. Because that's what I tell my kids, you boss of yourself. You've got to be boss for yourself. And so, and that fella looked down and he goes, oh, okay. And then my son come back. He's like, all right, you can go now, you know. Uh, but he wanted me there, I think, just in case that fella didn't understand him, you know. Um, and it, there must have been at some point where that fella had to tell him what to do, you know. And it's not that they can't listen to what, is being asked of them to do, but the idea that they're boss of themselves, you know, um, because it's a really good way also to teach them about consent and to teach them about other people being boss for themselves too, you know, and um, like even like emotional literacy, you know, um, some, you know, how many times we hear people say, oh, you upset me, you made me cry, you did this, you did that. And it's like, yes, um, but then people will also do things like they'll get upset and they'll break something and they go, Oh, see what you made me do. No, no, you got to be boss of yourself. 
you know, I might have upset you, but I didn't make the decision to chuck your plate on the ground. Um, stuff like that. It's, it teaches us about accountability. It teaches us about, you know, um, the effect of our decisions. It teaches us about, you know, if you, if someone else doesn't want you to do what they want to do, what you want them to do, that, you know, they're boss of themselves, just like your boss of yourself. And so it's been a really good tool to teach my kids, you know, um, just that simple thing of autonomy and, and being boss of ourselves and, and having that sovereignty. Um, again, though, like, you know, that's just another, another level that sovereignty operates on. But it is very much about, you know, not just preparing our children to be sovereign and self-governing, but, but preparing them to carry those obligations into the future and to carry on those cultural tenets of, uh, you know, child rearing, but just of also like, you know, being self-governing as mob, you know, um, and there's a lot of things like that within our child rearing practices, um, that apply, you know, when you're older as well. Mm -hmm. And that, that brings me around to, um, something else that, that is obviously striking with this piece, which is, is something that is clear and one must engage with it when they engage with this work, uh, partly because of there's a visual aid to that, which is the beautiful artwork that you did uh, yourself as well as a part of this project, which had uh, your Auntie Lilla, had Auntie Mary Graham, uh, Chelsea Bond as well, and also Ruby Wharton in this incredibly beautiful uh, piece of, of art, which I would love to have a little bit of yarn about the artwork, uh, which has a really unique flavor to it, but also to have a little yarn about, I guess, again, what keeps coming through in this conversation, which I also love the fact that we talked about indigenous strengths and beauty so much in this conversation, as opposed to a genocide and ecocide. And I think that's quite symbolic of the strong uh, resonance within your work that, that is founded in, in Indigenous strengths and Indigenous relationships and certainly Indigenous community and for you as an Indigenous woman amongst a broader community of amazing Indigenous women from a variety of walks of life as well, from diverse uh, walks of life. I would really just love to hear uh, a little bit about how important that was for you within this piece to elevate other Indigenous women as a part of this beautiful piece of work as well. And again, in terms of the artwork, it would be amazing to hear a little bit about that also. Yeah, the artwork was a real journey. Um, I think the, with, with like wanting to quote other women, um, I think there's a lot of reasons that I want to quote people. A lot of the reasons that I like to quote um, Ani Lilla and Ani Mary is because I have learnt so much from them. And so me um, taking an opportunity to talk about my ideas and my perspective on anything, um, I always want to pay homage to the fact that they've been formed through experiences and through learning of, you know, my aunties um, and, and a lot of people. And I guess that's the same kind of idea with um, Dr. Wadigo, you know, um, and, and spending so like, you know, spending time around Chelsea, like, you know, even just reading her material and knowing her as a person. Um, I feel, I feel empowered as a woman, you know, as a Murray woman, um, <clears throat> witnessing her, you know, witnessing, um, what she's able to do and that the, um, the way that she navigates uh, being in this world and the way that she advocates for mob and the way that, you know, um, I, I honestly find her very inspiring and very um, empowering to watch, you know, as a young person from the same kind of community of, you know, Brisbane Blacks represent. Um, I think it's been, you know, it's all, she's always been, 
um, a great source of in- inspiration, but also like an example of like, I guess what you can do, you know, she's always been a good example of, you know, yep, you can have kids and still be deadly and still have, you know, all these other things. Like, I don't know how she even does half of what she does, to be honest. Um, I wish I had the willpower and the, you know, the time management Lord. Um, she's incredible. Um, but not only is she incredible in what she does, but in the way that she thinks and in the way that she, um, you know, the way that she agitates colonialism and, uh, you know, the, the way that she talks about race and the way that she navigates those conversations. Um, she's honestly just so sharp and so on point. And yeah, I, I mean, you really couldn't write about race in this country without quoting her. Um, and you know, just, I think it's similar with Ruby, you know, um, and the, you know, the amount of deadly things that Ruby has been able to do in community. I think that's been really important for me. And I think it's, it, it was important for me to highlight Ruby's voice also specifically because she's younger than me as well. And so I really love the fact that the work that she is doing is, is it's, it's the, you know, it is that next generation stuff. Um, and, and I don't say that as in, like, I'm not that much older than her. Um, and, and I don't see myself as a really a part of a different generation to her because we aren't very different in age, but I think the work that she's doing is very important for the way that she is, she is one of these people that are tying the past to the present and tying the future to the present at the same time and and creating that continuity of cultural tenets and cultural values. Um, And also doing that with black politics and the, the black political perspective and driving that forward. Um, You know, the work, I also want to um, highlight the work with the Camilla Ray next generation and support what they're doing to protect their country as well. Um, I think that was really important to me, but I think in terms of the artwork, what I really wanted to do with that, like, cause I, I, I had a lot of different artworks that I was putting together um, and, and created for this piece. Um, some of them, most of the other artwork ideas that I had really spoke to the violence and really spoke to the eco side and the genocide um, and the connections between the both. Very, you know, I would say like they, they were very powerful imagery but also I could see how it could be very triggering um, for mob. And so I was reminded of, you know, one of the ideas that um, my good friend, Dr. Fiona Foley talks about in her book, uh, Biting the Clouds. And she talks about the idea of how do we, uh, how do we talk about violence without recreating it? And that's what I think really inspired me to change my perspective and change my approach from one of displaying the violence um, to one of displaying the strengths. And I think, you know, um, the reason that I, that I felt it was fitting as well was because the reason that ecocide and genocide are so intrinsically linked is the same reason that we are our country. You know, it's the same. Well, that's the reason, right? When they kill us, they kill our country. When they kill our country, they kill us. But it's also that when we live, our country live, and when our country live, we live. So that's how I, you know, got that idea of putting country into the physical frame. Um, And, you know, um, because that's that's really what it is. And I, I truly believe that my country is in my DNA and my DNA is in my country. And I believe that, you know, even if they can't find it on a microscope, like it's there, I know that, I know that it's in my bones, you know, it's it's just like the same idea of, you know, we, <clears throat> my mob, we, um, we are people of the rainbow serpent, Mundagata. And so I know that Mundagata is in the ground, in the waterways. I know that Mundagata is there. 
it doesn't matter if Mundagara isn't there or is there. I know that the beginning of life is with natural resources. I know that it is in the waterways that we, you know, we, I know we need water, air, fire, land to live. So I know that my creator is within those resources. Um, whether I believe it's Mundagara or whether I believe it's someone else, those resources are what physically, scientifically gives me life. That is literally the, the creator of life. And so if I assign that to Mundagara, the rainbow serpent, then Mundagara is the water, Mundagara is the air, the fire, the land. And so the way that our whole entire philosophy works, it connects us so um, powerfully to place that, um, you know, this is, it, it. there are many levels beyond what I just put, you know, in, into the essay, but there's many levels spiritually as well that ecocide and uh, genocide is, is linked. Um, but I think it is that thing, and, and, it, and it's kind of similar to the idea that, you know, if we are to inherit generational trauma, we are to inherit generational strength. Um, it, it's similar to that idea and that ju juxtaposition because having those artworks is a representative of what is so important. It's a representative of, of why genocide is so bad and why ecocide is so bad because um, that connection is so important and that connection is what created, in my perspective, in my opinion, what created humanness is our connection to land. And so to sustain humanness, we need that connection to land. And that is really um, what I think the piece is, is also more so about. Because on one hand, I really wanted to talk about truth telling, um, because in the climate movement, like no one talks about truth telling. Um, Everyone likes for their little acknowledgement before their um, <clears throat> before their event and stuff like that. They like to look good, um, but a lot of the time people fail to understand the the real gravity and the real reality of how important our understanding of life is to the uh, existence of humanness and to the sustainability. Of So that's why I made that work. Well, your explanation is as beautiful as the artwork and your explanations and your insights have been so beautiful across all of the, the facets of this discussion about your wonderful article that you wrote, your essay rather, that you wrote as a part of the Willis Centre Diagribble series in 2021, which was intrinsic connections between ecocide and genocide. It's been such a pleasure to have this yarn here today, here uh, over internet connection, but very grateful still for some form of connection to be able to have this deadly conversation. So it has been a, a pleasure to have this conversation. It truly has been. I've been very grateful to have this yarn here today. I've got a lot out of it personally. I feel very privileged to be able to receive uh, the amazing a variety of different insights that we've been able to discuss today. And it goes well beyond the, the piece, the essay, Intrinsic Connections Between Ecocide and Genocide. It takes us into a beautiful world. And I hope that everybody that's been listening to this conversation here today with myself, Neil Morris and Tilla Watson, has really got something special out of this yarn in the same way that I have. So again, I really want to thank you, Sis, for sharing all that you have today in this yarn. And I look forward to uh, another yarn uh, that goes beyond uh, where we are within the screens here today. But um, before thank we you. do wrap up, it's my honour. And I'm very honoured as well that we're going to close up today with a piece of writing of yours as well which is in the format of some spoken word, and it goes by the name of Two Worlds. And I will now pass it across to Teela to share this piece with us to 
wrap up our session here today uh, through will attempt to discussing Teela's piece, Intrinsic Connections Between Ecocide and Genocide. So this is my piece called Two Worlds. I wrote it um, a couple of years ago now. There's a world that's based on competition and race, full of lost souls, distorted and displaced. No connection, just infection. Thousands of years in the wrong directions, billions of tears, for all causes on the spectrum of human emotions, caught up in commotion where there's no hope in hope and, and all this while just floating on oceans of pain, filled with plastics all the same and rotten flesh. And it's always just when I feel I need to be saved that I feel a wave pushing me to a shore, back to belonging, away from the haze, back to knowing so much more than just the colonial gaze. And I remember I'm lucky not to be caught in this maze. And I think it's because I was raised in the meeting place of two worlds. This other world is much older than the first, much wiser, more important than I could ever put into words. It holds the knowledge that could heal this earth, this place here where humanness was birthed. Everything is connected, all living things. This world is the reason my spirit still sings. My auntie's backyard in West End. My cousin's kids was my first best friends. Her place was like a bridge filled with cultural privilege. We were given space to interpret the concrete from our earth-kissed perspectives. We weren't given the feelings of defeat yet or being rejected. Just little Murray kids being loved and protected being given the foundations, being taught the meanings of creation and the method of good relations. Through rhymes and riddles and games and giggles, life was sacred. Magic happened all the time. My auntie, she was like a rainbow all on her own, lighting a fire in my heart that would always guide me home. We were taught to share and care, to think and connect and we could go anywhere, bridging us to the future and the past. And it felt like for forever, but the time went too fast. We didn't know how far down the water was. These two worlds related in a softer sense than what was really true. My experience was far more sheltered from the trauma than I ever knew. My experience was love and opportunity and all that was given water grew. My auntie, she would keep our minds busy like sharpening tools so that when we grew up, we could find, fix, reframe and refuel. We figured riddles and sang songs so that when everything started falling down, I still knew where I belonged, even when everything is wrong. Even when I don't want for these two worlds to ever have met, even when all I want is to forget the babies buried with their heads above the ground, the blood on the wattles, the singing turn into screams and the constant sound of breaking dreams, calling in languages that may never be found. And here I am now, trying to raise these babies in the meeting place of two worlds, the way that she might have done it. One world I carry bearing down on my shoulders to stop it from crushing the one in my stomach. Thank you. That was a very beautiful piece here today being shared with us by the incredible Tilla Watson. She's a Biragaba Gangaloo woman. That piece was two worlds and it was shared as a part of this conversation here today through Willa Center, discussing Tiller's essay, The Intrinsic Connection Between Ecocide and Genocide, which has been a part of the 2021 Dark River Argument series through Willa Center. My name is Neil Morris. It has been such an honor to have this discussion today here with Tiller Watson. Thank you again, sis, for everything that you've shared here today. And it's truly been an honor to share in this experience with you. Thanks so much. And for everybody that's watched this piece today, be sure if you have not yet to go and read Teela's incredible piece of writing. It is the intrinsic connections between ecocide and genocide. Be sure to share that around as well and share the powerful work that is the work of Teela, also known as Ancestress, who is such an important voice and artist for indigenous people in this time and we are privileged to have had a share here today with us so again thank you for joining us here today visit wheelercenter.com for the best in books writing and ideas from melbourne australia and around the world